<laughs> uh, friends, in 1959, the Soviet Union became the very first nation to map out the dark side of the moon. The Soviets used satellites to discover all these cool new craters, which they named after a bunch of Russian dudes. Uh, there's a crater named for chemist Dmitry Mendeleev, another one named after first man in space Yuri Gagarin, and over a dozen other, yeah, Gagarin, he's rocked, yeah. And there's like over a dozen others named after a bunch of Russian scientists, cosmonauts, and engineers. Cosmonauts, uh, however, there is one major exception on this moon map. It's located in the bottom corner of the map. It is the Jules Verne crater, found in one of the more lonely parts of the far side of the moon. The question I want to pose to you is, why Verne? Verne wasn't a scientist, he was a writer, he wasn't Russian, he was French, so why would the Russians give him a crater of his own? Well, most moonophiles believe it is because Verne wrote the classic science fiction prophetic novel, From the Earth to the Moon. But the real truth is much more nuanced than that. And to understand it, you have to know what Verne's fiction meant to everyday people living in the Soviet Union where I was born. Our Soviet Union was a really shitty place. Uh, <laughs> Oh no, oh no, so we couldn't go beyond the country's borders. We had these crappy black and white TVs, and even colored photographs were hard to come by. One of the few ways that we could experience the world in all its myriad beauty and colors was by reading Verne's adventure fiction, which is why Verne's most popular novel in the Soviet Union wasn't 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, because getting into a dang submarine and killing the British was something you could actually do in Soviet Russia. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, so uh, it was arguably this book, In Search of the Castaways, which I read when I was about seven or eight, along with millions of other Soviet children, and it blew my mind. It was really an amazing and fun book. Okay, it begins with the discovery of a message in a bottle. Uh, this message was thrown into the ocean by some castaways that are badly in need of rescuing. But there's a problem. Ocean water has damaged this message seen here, and half the wards are gone. Only one major crew clue remains, uh, a single coordinate. 37 degrees latitude south, the 37th parallel, which cuts across of the southern hemisphere. And as you see on this map, there are very few places where the parallel, parallel intersects with both land and water. So the heroes of our novel decide that they'll just get on a ship and, yeah, yeah, shit. and, yeah, and they'll uh, circumnavigate the entire 37th parallel marked in the red, stopping all the places where it cuts across both land and water, and then let's just find the castaways. So they sail off, they go to the shores of Patagonia where they fight off giant birds, and then they sail east towards Australia and New Zealand where they get attacked by cannibals who want to eat them and possibly rape them. Uh, no, okay, so as an aside, uh, yeah, yeah, eight-year-old me was extremely disturbed by Burr, Vern's implicit threat of cannibal rape. Like, not cool, Vern. Still not as bad as Mufasa's death in The Lion King. But <laughs> and, and just as our heroes are about to lose all hope, they come across this speck at 150 degrees longitude. And by speck, I mean a literal speck on this late 19th century map, whose label reads, Maria Theresa Rock, question mark. Uh, it is at this questionable location where they find and rescue the castaways. Ironically enough, a clue to the castaways' location was present in the message the whole time under a single French word, abor. You see, on French maps, Maria Theresa goes under a different name. Ile Tabor, Tabor Island. And if our heroes, our heroes could have totally found the castaways right away if they hadn't been using a freaking British map like a bunch of bloody wankers. Uh, so when I was a kid, I thought the dual name plot twist was a neat little trick that Vern totally pulled out of his ass. But no, he wasn't making shit up. Vern wrote the novel using actual cartographic data. One can almost imagine Vern hunched over a bunch of different maps in different languages with a magnifying glass going, <gasps> I shall use this island in my tale. Uh, 
to, to Vern, Tabor Island represented the most desolate and lonely place on Earth to be a castaway. He liked it so much, he used it in another one of his novels, The Mysterious Island. Uh, in this this novel, in this novel, a bunch of Civil War soldiers escape a Confederate prison camp by riding out on a hot air balloon, as one does. Uh, they get they get caught in a storm and crash land somewhere in the South Pacific on a mysterious island. Now, the island in question is not Tabor, but it is right next to Tabor, and our castaways' efforts to build a ship and travel. And travel to Tabor is a major plot point in the book. Geography, yeah. Uh, geography also plays a major role in the plot as well, which is why in 1874, Verne had commissioned the making of this map of the island. And if you zoom into the upper quadrant of the map, you see a latitude and longitude that Verne put in, which was a really cruel thing for him to do because generations of children, myself included, grew up with these lat longs like tattooed into our brains because this is a place you could actually go to and t you know, take part in Verne's adventures and do all the cool shit he wrote about if only our parents let us, which they <laughs> most certainly did not. But it is no surprise that in the decades after Verne's death, people began to wonder, well, what is actually known about the area surrounding Tabor Island? And the answer is not very much. Uh, Tabor was discovered in 1843 by the American whaling ship, the Maria Teresa. Uh, the ship's captain was a man named uh, Asaph P. Tabor, or Asaph P. Tabor, the French turned it to Tabor. And uh, uh, according to the captain's log, some sailors saw a bunch of waves breaking over something over on the horizon in the distance. The logs never actually specified whether that something was land. And in fact, six months later, the Sydney News reported that uh, Captain Asaph had discovered a new and dangerous reef, implying that maybe it wasn't an island at all, it was a reef underwater. And the question of whether Tabor was an island or not remained a mystery for over a century until the 1960s, when comes along this man, uh, Dr. Don Miller. Miller was a Navy physician who made it his life's mission to send out a ham radio transmission from uh, the most distant and remote parts of the globe. So of course, Tabor Island was high on his list. In 1966, Miller succeeded in reaching Tabor Island. He sent out a radio call and took this really grainy photo. Uh, in his uh, correspondences, Miller would later, later describe his visit to the island thusly. As we approached the reef, it came out of the ocean and we landed and operated. And after we finished and were leaving, we looked back and saw the island sink back into the sea. Which was, no, I mean, this was a little weird because most islands don't just bounce back up and down, you know, in and out of the sea like a jack-in-the-box. So in 1973, the uh, New Zealand government decided to investigate. They sent forth this oceanographic research vessel, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the HMNZS TUI. Uh, the TUI arrived to the location, the coordinates of the island, and they found nothing there. But hey, maybe the island was just hiding under the water. You know. Uh, fortunately, the TUI had a trick up its sleeve, echo sounding, in which sound pulses are bounced up against the ocean floor like a tennis ball. At, uh, and then the time it takes for the pulse to come back up is measured to determine the ocean depth. Uh, the TUI discovered that the area around Tabor Island was 5,000 meters deep. That is really fucking deep. That's half the depth of the Mariana Trench. There is no island or reef hiding under there. So what the hell was going on? Remember, Don Miller wasn't just some random schmo. He literally wrote the book on long distance ham radio. He was highly respected in the ham radio community. And yeah, there were rumors that he liked to cut a few corners, but those were speculations and fake news and uh, <laughs> yeah, nothing, it means nothing. In 1980, Don Miller was found guilty by a jury of his peers of conspiring to murder his wife. And people realize he's a murderous fucking asshole and a liar, and he made up half the shit he said he did, including landing on Tabor. And what was worse, a lot of the upper echelon of the ham radio community knew about it and kept quiet because, <laughs> yeah, 
Organizations love hiding the sins of their more powerful members, but sooner or later that shit comes out and it bites you in the ass. Uh, so, yeah. Well, anyway, Jones won Alabama, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, so uh, Miller's carted off to prison, but the mystery of Tabor Island remains. And in 1982 comes along this man, oceanographer Henry Stommel, who gets access to Captain Asaph's original log book. And he looks at it and he discovers a mistake. And he realizes that the true longitude of Tabor Island isn't 150 degrees, it is 136 degrees, about 1,000 kilometers east. So uh, next year, they send a ship over to investigate ship and the ship discovers nada empty blue water tabor island does not exist it is what cartographers refer to as a phantom island an error on a map mistakenly recorded since the mid 80s tabor has been stricken from all our maps of earth but but Let's revisit our moon map again. We'll cut across the 37th parallel, uh, see where it intersects with 150 degrees longitude, and zoom in at the intersection point, and voila! The Shulvan Crater! Friends, Tabor Island exists up there, tantalizingly close, yet infinitely far, untrodden by the foot of woman or man. I'd like to raise my glass and offer a toast to that plucky young adventurer who will one day board a vessel, take off on the 37th parallel, and after many days and nights, they'll see on the horizon those shimmering, lonely sands of Tabor Island, just as Jules Verne would have wanted it. Woo! Worst things have happened to this Wolpertinger. It's fine. <laughs> thank, thank you, Leonard. <laughs> I hope, how many of you were here for, for Leonard's very first talk on the murmuration of Starlink?